Welcome everybody to this World Satsanga on the 30th of January 2021 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show and Kevin continues to do some fantastic work with his Moore Talk and the we call, they call us Chandler's uh, series on, on YouTube, fantastic work. Do check him out and see some of those episodes, there's some really good stuff on there showing you the different qualities of, of, of individual who channel or who are um, psychic or mediums etc, those sorts of things. Okay, so New Year and Happy New Year to you all because it's the first time I've had a chance to speak to you all. And we've got a lot of questions. As you can imagine, there's a lot that carried over from, from December's satsanga and there's a lot uh, been passed on to me in between. So uh, let's do our best to get through them if we can do. And so let's go through the agenda first. First part is a short talk by myself and how to avoid being pulled into conspiracy theories and misinformation. And I would guess that's a really relevant thing right now because there's lots and lots and lots of things flying around about um, things like vaccinations, specifically with the COVID-19 problem worldwide, whether the, the, there is a <laughs> something going on with COVID-19 or whether it's a bigger government, uh, world government or world uber government, so to speak, very hidden. Um, manipulation of, 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 the, of the general population of the earth but uh, these are all things that are, that, that are flying around so we're going to look at how we can avoid being pulled into them. Then we're going to go through all of the questions that were sent to me which is uh, about four and a half, uh, no three and a half pages so thank you very very much for those questions. I've had a quick look through, um, clearly I don't look at them and properly until the satsanga so everything comes out um, instantaneously uh, in a, a clean channeled way rather than me deliberating over them so you, you get the you, you get it as it comes which is which is good that's that's warts and all of course <laughs> and then we're going to have a meditation at the end which is a meditation to create peace in the world because we really do need it in all sorts of different directions we need to sort of reconsolidate ourselves and start to realize that we're a world um, civilization and not little pockets of civilization in various different parts of, of the world we call countries or even locations within countries. We need to start to think about becoming glo properly globalized rather than we think we globalized but we're actually not. Okay so let's have a look at the first part this is how to avoid being pulled into, into conspiracy theory and misinformation. Well the first thing to note is that generally these things start with a what do you think comments comment from somebody you were talking about and as soon as you hear these sorts of comments what do you think or I think or I'm not happy with or well such and such is not doing a very good job what do you think then you have to start to back away from it because then you're starting to get into the opinions of an individual who may or may not be educated in the right or wrong way and the education being the reading of misinformation or the hearing of misinformation or the viewing of misinformation from various different sources. And it's difficult for people to understand what misinformation is because there's a lot of information out there that is misinformation, but it has got an awful lot of truth interspersed around it. So we start to see that there is some good information in the misinformation but that's but that's the that's the anchor point that's the that's the the lure that's that's the the light to the moth so to speak it's it's what brings us in because there are bits that are true and therefore we think that because these bits are true and it's and they're known to be true then everything else is being true so that's another so that's a really is another way of, of realizing that if something is particularly true and then there's something else around on the side and there's no justification for it then you know that it's conspiracy and so you should back off and, and save your frequencies by not getting involved. Conspiracy uh, or getting involved in discussions on conspiracy theories perpetuates them, uh, amplifies them and creates an energy of attractivity around them and so, so they, they spread and they sort of fractally manifest and, and, and duplicate in or triplicate and quadru quadruplicate etc etc in all sorts of different ways. It's it's really about keeping your own energy and that's really really important. One of the things that we should do is use our, in, our um, intuition 
our clair sentience, if you want to call it that, our our cosmic thinking, our cosmic knowledge, or our state of understanding or, or unquantifiable knowingness, that something is right or wrong. So when we start to work and or communicating about various different conspiracy theories, we start to enter into the, uh, basically a gossip mode of some sort. It's a different level of gossip. Rather than talking about one particular individual that we don't like <laughs> and collectively don't like and therefore deride them, which is totally wrong because they are what they are. They're, they're another soul who's struggling through their incarnation to experience, learn and evolve within the constraints of their their particular life plan, doing it the best they can in the way they can. And sometimes they go off track and sometimes we go off track. But we should love ev everybody in the same way. So when we start to think, hear this happening, we should, you know, the, the starting mode of, of conspiracy theories, we should move away because it is really just another form of gossip. And also, you know, look at information and just know whether it's right or wrong. Again, use your intuition, to, you know, use what, what, what your heart tells you to say. You know, is this right? Say it to yourself. You don't need to say it to anybody else because when, as soon as you start to say it to somebody else, you start to create a condition where they're being pulled into a conspiracy theory that you're discussing within yourself, but you've just, but you've, but you've um, verbalized, so to speak. So it's, it's keeping yourself knowing what you know. It's almost like creating your own reality bubble. We all do this anyway, subconsciously, but this is a conscious effort to create that which you, which you know. And you have to think of it this way. Is it going to affect me in what I do? Does it stop me from doing what I'm doing? Does it make what I'm doing more difficult? Does it really change the way I am? And if, if, if the information that's been thrown at us doesn't do any of these things, because it won't in real terms, because we are, you know, we're individualized sentience in a, in a body that's doing a job. We've, we've got a job to do. We've got a family to raise. We've got a, um, we've got in, interests we have. We have our spiritual progression if we're that way inclined. And we simply have to realize that in general, these things don't affect us. And if they affect us in a minor way, for instance, with the lockdowns, with the, with the COVID-19 virus, then we simply work with it and it will eventually dis disappear because other people might be doing it under duress or, 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 or you know, in, in agreement with the, with, the, with the rules and regulations. But it creates this, well, I'm not going to stop myself from doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it within the rules and the spirit of what's, what the rules are. So I'm going to continue my, my way of being, but not break any rules, which is fine. And that's the way to do it, is to sort of be in your own bubble keeping doing what you're doing but making sure that you're not affecting anybody else and so we, we can continue to work within our own interests so to speak but not affecting the interests of anybody else because of breaking any rules or regulations that are either permanently or temporarily bestowed upon us so create your own bubble of reality which is basically your own event space and you know this is doing it consciously normally it's done subconsciously normally it's done uh, as, a, as an automatic function of the way event space works which cre which 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 is you know we create think extra different realities or different event spaces based upon our uh, our thought processes and our, and our, deci our decisions based upon our, our challenges so we can choose as part of those challenges to just you know be okay with what's going on around us and keep on doing what we're doing we can still read our books we can still you know play football with the kids in the garden we can still um, go for a walk um, as long as we keep away from people we can still communicate with our family and friends over various different modalities that we've got telephones mobile phones videos such as zoom skype boatim WhatsApp, WeChat, QQ, all these different things are there, there for us to continue to, to, to communicate. And so we can do this and still maintain our own energies. Because in maintaining your energies, you're, you're, again, you're stopping this potential to be sucked into a conspiracy theory and then create this, this condition where you're, you're pulled into a thought process which is, which is physically derived because conspiracy theories are only only occur in the physical universe um, mostly in the third frequency but they can also of course be created elsewhere but the more the higher the frequency we go the the less 
the more the, the less chance we do this sort of things because the more um, exposed to the higher frequencies and the understanding of who and what we are, and so we don't need to create any conspiracy theories because we are we, we know we know what the greater reality is in various levels of um, expansivity depending upon our frequency that we incarnate into. So stay within your own comf your own thought processes. Don't get pulled into somebody else's. Use your inte your um, intuition to you know judge whether it's right or wrong what bits are right what, what bits are wrong and just you know look at the facts really because a lot of the facts are being twisted and, and turned upside down and back, backwards and forwards or being selectively used i can remember a long time ago when i was when i was at uh, at, at, at university doing various different things and um, one of them was to create a statistical report based upon the uh, the evidence of the experiments I was doing and and, the way, and somebody said to me one of the statisticians said to me well you do you do know that there's lies damn lies and statistics <laughs> which which basically said you can use statistics correctly or you can you can twist them by using only a certain part of the statistics or using only a different or, or, or using uh chunks of statistics that, that sort of suit your argument so again just look at this look at the the, inf the information that's there use your own intuition to judge which, which which statistics are right and which statistics aren't being used correctly and don't get in, involved in the thought process of you know getting angry about it or or discussing it or phoning somebody up and, and, and venting your frustrations about it because that creates again the perpetuation of the conspiracy theory or the dissatisfaction with the way that the the localized leaders and the, and the, and the country-based leaders and the world leaders are are, are are handling these things they don't know what we do and we don't know what they're doing but it doesn't matter what they're doing as long as we don't create karma by by attaching ourselves to the physical and of course being involved in conspiracy theories is part of that then we're okay they can carry on with their karma because if we start to involve ourselves with conspiracy theories we enter into a group of individuals who are thinking in the same way remember birds of a feather flock together and that's the same with spiritual work keep high frequency if you enter into a into discussion with people who are talking about conspiracy theories we enter into group karma because we're anchoring ourselves in the energies surrounding something which is probably can't be probably can't be proven um has some elements of truth in there but has an awful lot of elements of some form of control in there and some t and some of these conspiracy theories are designed to control us to create a level of control in a different way so keep your distance from all this stuff stay high frequency stay meditating stay in a position psycho spiritually where you know where you are and you understand what's happening around you and you're happy with your condition and you can continue to do what you do in a way which is consistent with any um, limitations associated with location environment and circumstance okay a bit sort of global and a bit sort of nebulous but basically it's it's it's, it's designed to make us think sit up and take notice think and really be in a position where we are not accepting everything but we don't need to accept it we don't need to discuss it we just let it be in the background and that's the best way for these things just let it go in the background you know when i look out of my window and i look across the the um the bristol channel to the to to, to somerset from from um, from south wales i don't know what they're doing unless i unless i zoom in <laughs> um, i don't know what they're doing in western super or 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 or, or Nail C because i'm not interested and that's the way we should look at it it's not it's not go, what they're doing doesn't affect you here and now and that's the way to think about it that's the way to make sure that you obs observe a few small rules of not getting involved in something which is ultimately going to link you into a group a group karmic condition okay well thank you for listening to that and i hope it made some sense and i hope it's helped in some small way which is um, always useful it's useful for me as well to go through it okay we've got lots of questions here and jm has got 10 and uh, these are all um ha passed on from the December satsanga so I'm going to hopefully read these out without making a mess of it uh, <laughs> um, but but basically I'll, I'll try to answer these in as, as clear and as, as succinct a way as possible I'll put my teeth back in so in the first one 
In, in, this is based upon the book called The Curators, by the way. Um, in the Cedars chapter of The Curators, you discuss with Source Entity 1 the difference between a being and an entity. Per Source Entity 1, a being is, created, is a created sentient, whereas an entity develops sentience on its own, not having bestowed on it by another being. Per this definition, the origin and the arm are entities and, and who else, but since we are all created by the origin, the Source Entities are beings not entities, per definition. It seems like source entity, source being one is a more proper thing to call a, a source entity rather than source entity one, although I'll continue to use source entity in my meditations. Uh, actually, any th is, I think there's a bit of a typing error here, to be, to be, to be honest, um, so I'm, I'm going to slightly adjust it. An entity is sentience, which is individualized from another entity or being. So a source entity is a source entity because it, it's created from the, the individualized sentience and energy from the origin and our true entity selves are entities as well because those are created from the individualization of sentience and energy from the source entity and our souls or our aspects are the same and so are shards a being is one where the energy has, has, has gone through a level of darwinian based evolution to give an example where it creates its own sentience um, as, a, as a result of going through a number of different processes which are described in the, the Origin Speaks called the Road to Sentience. And the being is therefore created through its own evolution, so to speak, of its own energies that, that goes through the process of creating levels of minor intelligence or attractivity, minor, minor intelligence, um, consciousness, awareness, self-awareness, creativity and ultimately um, sentience and then a recognition of sentience is, is, is and can be detached from the energy that uh, gave birth to it so to speak. The, the thing is that the, the, the origin is a, a being so the origin is self-derived it is, it, is, it is sentience that has been created as a function of its own evolutionary path even though there was some assistance from event space and event space gave up its own potential to be the dominant sentience uh, recognizing that the origin could be a bigger, a much more complete level of sentience and therefore became the dominant en entity, sorry, the dominant being, <laughs> I'll get it right, that, um, that, that, allows, that allowed the opportunity for the sources to be created as a function of it wanting to understand itself better. So the origin is a being, source entity is a being, uh, true entity, sorry, the origin is a being, the source entity is an entity. <laughs> You see how easy it is to get confused? <laughs> I'll start again. Origin is a being. The source entity is an entity. The, our true entity cells are entities. Aspects are entities, shards are entities. There are clearly other sent levels of sentience that are created and are classified as beings. And there are some sources that are that, that are, that are self-generated, so to speak, as a as a, as a function of this of, stray set of of energies collecting together and be going through the the processes of the road to sentience. Okay, so that's the way to think of it. Origins of being that created the source entities as entities that created true energetic cells as entities as created aspects as entities as created shards as as entities. Okay, but there are bits and pieces in between. Okay, next question. I read in a different book that the Earth is quarantined by being at the far end of our galaxy and by being close to the edge of our universe. Are we really close to the edge of our universe? How close? Like how many astronomical units or AUs? Uh, my understanding is that the, the Earth, it, it, the location of the solar system is, is, is right close to the end of one of the spiral arms of our Milky Way, the, the, the galaxy we call the Milky Way. And that, that's that galaxy is basically very close to the edge, what I would call, if you think of this, as an example, if you think, think of the physical universe as a sphere, it's not, but it's, it's something we can use as, a, good, as, as, a, as a, a way of using an illustration to help us understand it. It's more amorphous than that. Um, but if you think of it as a sphere, and we, and we have a northwest, east, and east, northwest, no, sorry, north, south, east, and west. 
I'm getting north and south dyslexia. North, south, east and west, and then forwards and backwards. We are forwards, south, east, and, and sort of close to the sort of boundary of where the, the collective frequencies that create the physical universe are clearly in full dimension one and before it goes become before the next jumping frequency make, makes it into into uh, the second full dimension okay so that's 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 pretty much how close we are how close are we in terms of astronomical units i'm told we're 259 galaxies away from the edge from the demarcation line how's that 259 galaxies away okay that's galaxies that we can see in the first three frequencies by the way because there are other galaxies in between it's just that we can't see them because we're not the right frequency but if we had a, a telescope that, the, that existed on the 12th frequency we'd notice that the, the physical universe is absolutely packed with galaxies and different environmental areas that support the potential to incarnate at different frequential levels okay so just what is the edge of our universe? It's the, it's the, it's the demarcation between the, the first full dimension and the second full dimension. It's the difference between the 12th frequency and the 13th frequency. The 13th frequency is a different level of frequency. It's a jump upwards in frequency and it's just enough to allow the ability for a self-contained simultaneously occurring universe to be derived within the the frequencies and the, and the subsequent energies whereas in the first full dimension they are they're, they're, they're so low that they're all required together so ba so basically what we have is a a condition where there's a quantum leap in terms of the finitude or, or the ability to create an environment associated with each jump in frequency when we get to the 12th frequency and then go into the 13th it's a massive jump this is why there's 12 dimensions 12 12 frequencies required to create the physical universe and the physical universe is the only universe in the first in the first full dimension but in the second full dimension there's 30 there's 36 universes because each of the frequencies is a, is a, is a quantum leap in, in infinitude and therefore the ability to to, to to house content so what is immediately beyond the edge of our universe um, well basically it's, it's like a substructure there's a there's a, a bit of a, a I can't even call it a gap. It's it's a demarcation between one f dimension and another dimension, and within the dimensions they're held together by a substructure. That substructure is the the structure behind the the structure behind and within and without the structure that we that we understand as the multiverse, and so it's the structure that, that is clearly part of the source, but is ultimately part of the part of the origin as well and so there is there is structure energetic structure frequential structure that is that is still part of the multiverse but it's it's a different part of the multiverse so to speak consider the, consider the framework okay um this this is quite because it le links into the next question in the architect source entity one states that you have been working with it, its peers and the origin for long enough to be supremely confident in this information are you? I don't feel uncomfortable. I don't feel unconfident. I don't feel uncomfortable with it. It feels right. And, and that's the thing. Um, if something doesn't feel right, um, you shouldn't be broadcasting it. If there's any doubts about it, you shouldn't be broadcasting about it uh, in any way, shape or form. If, you've, if, if there is a, a difference between one person's information and somebody else's information, we have to consider the fact that maybe it's the same thing but said in a different way or maybe there's a, an error somewhere if there's any function of the information that classic that could be classified as an error then it's not it's not broadcast and for me i f it feels it feels right it feels true so I, I don't have any problems with the information at all so i'm very confident in it uh, next question source entity one tells you in the architects that you're not in the evolutionary cycle but of course the rest of us are so no evolution for me, <laughs> for you, Mr. Om. No. Um, well, it's interesting because a lot of the Om don't get involved in the evolutionary cycle. And, and, and the way to not be involved in the evolutionary cycle is not to be involved in anything that creates things. Now, 
Dolores Cannon um, was very good at, at identifying the the, um, <coughs> the fact that people who are here to do a, a job and a job that is above and beyond the normal um, role or, or life plan of an incarnate individual um, to experience and evolve generally don't have things like children because 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 children are karmic and so it's and if you have if you so still so children are karmic because you've created something you've created a responsibility for something so when we create something we are responsible for it irrespective of what it is where it is what frequency it's in what dimension it's in and so an awful lot of the arm don't well most of the arm don't get involved with anything that's that involves some form of creation sometimes we get we get, we get stuck into it and we, and, we, and, and get involved with it without knowing but in, in in a lot of things there are we're doing work and potentially it's for it's, it's for nothing although it's, you, it, there's another question further on down which is going to sort of be, be an interesting sort of counterpoint for us as well because there are there are some on that do enter into the evolutionary cycle and 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 again even even if an army is, is incarnate and and doing things which could potentially create karma they are not not a, not a, not should we say burdened by karma or burdened by um, anything associated with with, 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 with with evolution now just because an entity is not in the evolutionary cycle it doesn't mean they don't evolve and if you look at some of the some of the um, the the curators they are uh, and certainly the guide and helpers who, who help um, um, souls who who incarnate they're not in the evolutionary cycle per se but they do get evolution as a function of working with those entities who incarnate because it's sort of given to them it's it's it's, it's sort of shared so to speak so although there's although it are not in the evolutionary cycle um, they do evolve it's just that their evolution is um shall we say not even automatic it's it's it just happens as a function of just being with everything else evolving okay next question number seven in the architects you describe backfield people as transient individuals that were created by us all to fill in the gaps in the background of our, of our existence and experience do we actually consciously create these people if so why do i have no recollection of this activity um we The backfield people are, are a different quality of sentience. They're a different um, TES. They're a different soul type, for example, and and they are and they they are here by transient. It means that they're, they're not going to not not going to f go into the the vast tranche of incarnations that, that the vast general population of the Earth and the vast general population of the, of the physical universe in all of its frequencies are going to go through. They are experiencing in. Um, individualized free will but they will evolve in a completely different way they won't be going through the, the process of you know getting rid of lots of lots of karma although they will accrue karma of course but they they will they they will have to be in a position where um, they have fulfilled the role of backfilling recreating the environment the population of the environment so that those other incarnate aspects or souls or, or shards in fact can do the work they're doing without the the shock of seeing the population dramatically reduce as people go up the frequencies because as we got the frequencies we do actually you know, zone out so to speak of the perceptual range of those individuals who are staying in the low frequencies so their role is to is to be here and create the balance of population whilst the rest of us move, in, move into the next level or ascend to the next level either within this incarnation or outside of the incarnation um, and so they are not part of our creation we don't we haven't created them they are a function of the creation of the the, the, the original creative um, decision process that the, that the source entity made when it split out and individualized countless billions of different um, units of sentience and energy to create all the TESs etc so they're they're we haven't created them. Sources created them. They were part of the original manifestation of, of individualized of individualized sentience. Um, 
but they won't be here as long as we are because they're only here whilst we move to the next level. Okay, but they still benefit, they still evolve in, in their own way and they will still evolve as a function of, of being here. But, um, but they won't be, they, they won't have, the only benefit to them is they, don't, they won't have to go around all of the different depths and details of, 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 of karma that we, that we do. And, and to some extent you can see that these, these individuals are, um, they're attracted to karmic things, they're attracted to materialism, they're attracted to thought processes that are, that are low frequency. So low frequency thoughts, behaviours and actions are sort of almost part of their beingness. But that's, that's okay because they're, what I've been told now is they're sort of spared a lot of the, a lot of the, the recovery processes that, that, that most of us have to go through to, to remove the karmic um, links with, with, with other incarnate individuals and with ourselves within as a, as a function of us um, working with certain circumstances in certain ways with certain individuals as well in certain environments okay that's uh, thank you for that question very good uh, next question in the enders you describe the the alternate world war ii event space where all forms of civilization have all but disappeared my father fought in World War II, so there was a, a version of him that experienced all the destruction of those extra bombs in the beginning and the end of, of life on the earth. Did he ever exist in that reality? We all exist in all of the different versions of realities that we would potentially have made a decision to be part of. So when we incarnate and we are in a position to make a decision, we go from one particular place to another in terms of our understanding of, of what we want to do. So, for instance, if, if I get out of a bus and I turn right, I could have turned left, or I could have maybe gone straight on if we are at a junction. So there's potentially one or two, and maybe three, maybe even four decisions we, we can make. And that as, as we make one decision, we feel that our consciousness, our sentience, goes in that one decision, in, in that one way. But in reality, with event space, it splits out. And there's another version of us goes in another way, and another version goes, in, goes, in, goes into the third way. And all of those other individuals who choose to be in that particular event space as well also enter it. And so we have you know, duplicates of ourselves, triplicates of ourselves, quadruplicates of ourselves, etc., 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 to potentially thousands of ourselves experiencing the thousands of different event space, spaces that are created individually and collectively and, and, and sort of globally, so to speak, to experience all the different variations. And so there are going to be variations where World War II didn't happen as well, where everything was sorted out and we're living in a, in a completely different state of uh, civilization and interaction with each other. So, and, and in the event where that particular decision process that, that, created it, that, that resulted in war didn't happen, um, or maybe Hitler wasn't didn't didn't get to Chancellor of of of, of Germany, and something else happened. You know, the, maybe maybe the war didn't happen, and that, and, that, and I know that this we ha we do have a case where the war didn't happen, but where other wars potentially happen later. So to answer that question, um, yes, he did. He was part of that and other multiple different realities that are of different variations upon the upon that particular um, war. Unfortunately, okay. Next question, just two more from JM. When explaining about the recorders, you address the source entity and reference when we talk in private. Are these longest discussions or compared to the conversations you have with source entity in the public? Or are your private discussions mere brief episodes? Um, to answer the question, they, they can be in depth or they can be momentary. You know, sometimes when they're momentary as well, you know, huge concepts can be um, you know, given to me and although it can seem like a couple of seconds of interaction or, or, or reception of, of, of a concept or, or an idea or, 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 or knowledge you know it can take quite a long time to understand it in some level of detail that allows me to broadcast it to the, the, the general spiritual public or metaphysical public so sometimes it can be very small but but you know but yield an awful lot of information and sometimes it can be a long time and yield what appears to be a small amount of information. So really, it, it, it just depends. It depends upon the information, it depends upon my state of connectivity, <laughs> um, how interested I am, what I'm doing at the time, and whether I can, you know, basically sit down and 
create a, the, the, the type of link that's required to support the information that's coming. And, and generally I can, but usually it's coming, it's, this information comes, you know, random ways at times. You know, when I'm writing the books, I'm focused on writing the books and I'm focused on going in, in the direction of the, or should say the direction I'm being told to go in to support the subjects in the chapters that I'm, that I'm writing. But in, in essence, there are things that happen, you know, just randomly when I'm walking, for instance, I'm going, maybe I'm cycling or maybe I'm, um, walking down the street or maybe I'm, I'm meditating or maybe I'm sitting in the chair watching television for example I don't watch television much to be, to be honest but it's 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 one of these things where things suddenly come to you and sometimes they come to me when there's no blockages when there's no resistance it's like now the door's open in it comes and then I, oh all right I, oh that makes sense okay okay right I'll, I'll remember that and I'll and I'll write it down somewhere and um, sometimes it comes into a book and sometimes it doesn't Okay, so good question, thank you. In the next question, in the recorders, source entity one specifies the number of cycles that the origin has left to experience in getting us all to become source entities as over 1,000 million, as a ballpark figure. Since we are currently on, on cycle three, this measure of passage of time struck events seems unachievable and staggers the imagination. Am I, am I understanding this correctly? Um, when we when we are in the lower frequencies of the physical universe or the lowest frequencies associated with the multiverse in source we experience things in a completely different way to what we do normally when we're in the in the, in the energetic you know a whole lifetime you know a lifetime of say well, 120 years is not even a blink of an eye in the energetic and it's already happened and so these vast so we say periods of existence are sort of arbitrary in real terms because we when we're here we've created a metric to to measure the, the passage of, of of events so to speak but when we're in in, in in the energetic it's sort of it's there we can we can move from event to event it's not not, not not an issue but the thing is that when we go through an evolutionary cycle we do we do we do learn <laughs> and we do evolve, hence the evolutionary cycle, moving on to the next evolutionary cycle. So as we move from one evolutionary cycle to another evolutionary cycle, everything that's been experienced in the previous evolutionary cycle and all the evolutionary content and progression that's been accrued in the first evolutionary cycle adds towards the ability to navigate through the next evolutionary cycle in a better, more robust, more efficient, more complete way. So as we move through an evolutionary cycle, we start to accelerate faster. So we go through one evolutionary cycle to the next, to the next, and to the next, until eventually an evolutionary cycle will be, you know, not even the blink of an eye in comparison to so many million Earth years, for example. Uh, so that's the thing to, or, or trillion Earth years, for example. So that's the thing to notice is that, that, that as we go from one cycle to the next, things happen faster. In fact, we're just starting the third evolutionary cycle, but in comparison to the amount of or the amount of time, I'll, I'll use the word time in this instance, taken to use, taken to experience the second evolutionary cycle, we're, we're, we're shifting, we're, we've, yeah, we're really going really, really quickly in comparison. And we're, we're going at warp speed, to use, an, to use a pun, in the third evolutionary cycle compared to what we were doing in the first evolutionary cycle. So as we move to the fourth evolutionary cycle, when we get there, we'll, be, we'll progress and pass significantly faster than the third evolutionary cycle. So it, so it seems like an, an, you know, an, an, an unimaginably, an unachievable long or period to go through, but it's eventually going to be extremely fast. And that's, that's, and that's, that's the benefit of, of, of evolution. Thank you, JM. Excellent questions. I'm going to be thinking about those for quite some time. OK, we've got some, some more now. One question from AB, a very sort of down-to-earth one. What are what are some foods that best serve my heart chakra? Any specific fruits, vegetables, or herbs? I'm told peppers are good. Um, the large sort of apple-shaped peppers are pretty good, um, and I'm also told, believe it or not, those jalapenos are good as well. So be careful how you eat these things because they can be quite warm. Um, anything else with the heart chakra? Uh, apples are good and some edible plants are also good apparently 
just, just having a look around my information. This is this is coming from source, by the way, or coming from the channel, channeled information rather than looking at a book. <laughs> um, I'm just having a look, so I can see. Spinach is good as well, apparently. Iron. Okay, so these are physical things. Don't forget that the chakras aren't physical as such. They're not gross physical anyway. They're energetic. But they, they and so the, the frequencies that they work with are, are their best food, for example. I mean, f the fourth frequency, excuse me, the fourth frequency is best for the heart chakra. The third frequency is best for the solar chakra. The second frequency is best for the um, sacral chakra, etc., etc., down to the root and up towards the the crown chakra. So really, that the 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 frequencies and energies associated with the frequency that they de that they design to work with is the best for them. But there are some physical things that give um, good energies associated with um, the, the the gross physical that actually can percolate over to some of the frequencies that are associated with the chakras. Not many, I have to add, but but in real terms, what I've just mentioned for the for the heart chakra, those those things that are that are good. I'm also told cabbage is good as well. But what I'm also what I've noticed is these things are raw. By the way, they're not cooked; they're raw. You keep them raw. Okay, that that'll help. Okay, uh, question from WP, um, and this actually this happened before um, before Christmas, and it's about a friend, a long-term friend. Um, I shan't name the individual, but I'll, I'll go through the question because it's quite a, quite a good question, and it's actually quite relevant to things that are happening with people where family, are, some families are having uh, a lot of issues with fa family members um, leaving the incarnation abruptly um, as a result of this COVID nineteen uh, virus that's happening around the world. Uh, people aren't expecting it, and they're going. Um, I just received some devastating news that a long-term friend of mine and his wife and college son, aged son were killed in a plane crash. This was I was advised the day after okay, that this happened. He was a very good guy, a successful businessman, helped a lot of people. This is not only about managing grief, but I'm trying to make sense of this, this kind of, of, of tragedy. Please remind me how we're supposed to react to such tragedies such as these. At an intellectual level, at an emotional level and spiritual level, it seems to trivialise life. In a world where there is where evil is all too common, here is a guy who made the world a better place, and his reward is to have his life, his wife, and his young son's life cut short. It makes no sense. Uh, thank you very much, and, we, and God be with you always. Well, it doesn't make sense from a human perspective um, at all, and it's it's it, it doesn't make sense. It's it's not fair, and it's, and it's a tragedy. But when we look at it in terms of the work that um, aspects do and whether they finish that work in a particular incarnation then it, or whether they want to experience the return to the energetic collectively or together th then it makes sense in this instance these three uh, as incarnate aspects that chose to work together had achieved what they wanted to achieve and this was a particular juncture that was chosen as a, as a potential um, point or space where they can move away from the physical and go into the into the energetic uh, collectively and so it was, it was simply just a, a juncture when we incarnate we have about five junctures where we can leave our incarnation that doesn't create a um, karma or any or evolutionary debt as a function of it and some of us can choose to leave at any point, really. When we do leave, we do choose to leave early, for example. And some of us choose to come back, and hence some of the near-death experiences where the body is, is terribly trauma, traumatized, either through illness or through accident um, or through you know, other forms of shock, for, for example. And they go back into the energetic, and then they decide to come back to assist in the progress of those other incarnate um, souls who are working with them in their father either in their family units or their friend or their friendship units or, or, or other um, interactions they have with them in the particular in particular circumstances environments and they come back and they say they made their decision to come back uh, in and that's that happens so 
so the 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 termination junctures or cannot can be reversed in in certain conditions but in real terms it is quite common for groups who incarnate together to work with each other do um end their or, or, or find a location within event space usually prior to the incarnation um, process starting in the first place or prior to incarnation they decide when they can leave and in this instance the air, the, the aeroplane crash was that, was that time to leave so although it seems a complete tragedy from a human perspective we have to love them for the choice that they've made to go in the way that they've gone and they've gone in a way which was quick um, <laughs> from a human perspective probably quite terrifying with the plane crash for example for, the, for those moments where there's uncertainty about whether the 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 the, the, the plane can be controlled or, or whatever but in essence it's it's a, it's a very fast way to go and a very and quite an efficient way to go and so we have to you know, thank thank source that the way that they chose to go was by and large fairly robustly quick and and and, and was um, beneficial to them because they they did suffer in the way that some people choose to suffer when they when they choose their termination juncture okay so from a physical perspective it makes no sense but from an energetic perspective it's part of their life plan they've collectively worked on um, and maybe they finished that and they get they just, they've all decided to, to go back to the back to the energetic to leave this incarnation collectively together okay very good thank you very much uh, WP for that excellent okay we're going we're still moving on quite well and um, this is from mo this is the lady who's uh, in japan and is translating the books into japanese so thank you very very much and she's also got lots and lots of questions for me okay so the first question is what is the metaphysical function of rainbows we can never reach them or touch them but they are always there i'm wondering if there are any, are there any functions in higher frequencies that we are aware of um <laughs> no they're, they're purely a physical function of the refraction of light through um, denser air, basically, or air that's that's got um, so sort of very humid, or cloud-based, or, or or is solid, and, and we start to have rain, for example. So it's, pu it's purely a, a refraction of light. There's no metaphysical function of them at all. Although we do feel good when we see them, we like to see them. So from a, from a metaphysical perspective, it, they they help to keep us um, uh, happy and, and 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 high frequency. Okay, so it's a good question, but uh, there's no, no, no other reason for, for them being there other than they're, they're, they're a physical function of, of, of weather, basically. Next question, why do lower astral entities feel that they're going to be extinct as a result of the Earth moving up the, through the frequencies? Are they not created by source? They don't evolve. Now, lower, lower, lower astral entities are created either by, by stray thought processes of anger, such as us, or the... Um, the evolution, the Darwinian evolution of energy, and and they, but they're not really, unless they can create, evolve to the point of having sentience, they they don't have any um, any reason to be here. To be, to be fair, specifically if they're created through stray human thought processes or other incarnate um, entities' thought processes, so so they they just they're just there. It's, 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 they're like sort of flotsam and jetsam, basically. So they, they, so when we, when we, for instance, if we move up the frequencies, and they attach themselves to us, they can't exist with us because they can't keep up with us, and they can no longer steal our energy, for example, and, and maintain their own because a lot of them can't metabolize their own energy. Okay, so they, so they, 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 they sort of fear and they create fear. And part of their ability to maintain their existence is to create fear and make us make us work with fear and in doing that we we keep ourselves low frequency and therefore we don't we don't move up the frequencies we don't send the frequencies and they stay where they are which is a benefit to them okay next question in the origin speaks page 69 it says all of these energies that were initially used for the creation of the 12 new origins were i noticed special that i decided to correlate them into one holding space saving them for future use Two questions based upon that comment. One, did the origin use all these energies to create the source entities, or did it only use a portion of them? It, okay, if, if, if it used only a portion of these energies to create the source entities, then what did it do with the rest? 
Well, the the rest of the energy was reabsorbed into the into the the origin. So the amount of energy that was used to create the source entity was was, was basically reprogrammed to a certain level. Although some of it didn't get reprogrammed, and that's why there are the OM. Um, basically the level of sentience and level of energy used to create a source entity is significantly lower than that which was used to create the 12 origin experiment so that energy was reabsorbed basically into the uh, into the origin and but some of it wasn't and hence <laughs> hence it stayed stayed as it was and therefore didn't become part of a source entity and became the various different forms of of of, of om and omnis Okay, so that's a good question. Thank you. Next question: How does the origin's energetic signature differ differ from the source entities? How, what does it feel like? Oh, it can't be described. It, it we go from the immense to the super immense. Um, to be fair, when I experience the origin and the and the source, I don't experience them in totality. Nobody could cope with it, um, certainly not in an incarnate state. And so I can't really describe it, but I do know that there's a difference in them. I know that one has, in the background, you just know it's infinitesimally larger than the source entity. And you know that when you communicate with the source entity, that you know that it's infinitesimally large. So it's like, you just know that there's a... It's like... It's, it's like... Um, it's so like looking into a well, and you can see the water at the bottom, and you know that, that, that's, that, is, that is a source entity. And then if you realise that the depth behind the top of the surface of the water goes is bottomless, that's, that's, that's the, the difference between a source and the origin, is you know that there's a, there's a point where, the, 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 where the, the, um, one feels the difference between the source, source entity, or a source entity, and the origin, because there is limitation to it. In reality but in the origin that limit there is no limitation there's limitation in terms of its recognition of self or its part or, or, or the, the level of sentience which is occupying itself that is limited hence the its desire to its create its desire to know itself better to accelerate its own evolution and to create other entities they exist in that's that, that's that um, progression in evolution but in terms of how big it is you just know that it's bottomless Whereas you know that there is a, you just know that the, the sources will feel, you can feel the limitations in the sources, even though it's sort of infinitesimally large. You know that it's, it's just phew, mind blowingly, unfathomably, uncalculably large behind it. Okay, very good. Right, so next question. When you are communicating with the origin, the OM, the source entities, do you hear their voice? Or do you get impressions of their message and translate and convert them into words? I'm wondering how does it, how does our ultimate creators, in brackets the origins, voice sound like? Um, <clears throat> I get information in all sorts of ways. I hear it. I see it. I, I'm it. I be it. <laughs> um, I visualise it. Uh, I just know it. It's there. The there's a, there's a there's a difference in the, the energy signature associated with with, with the om, with an for instance, with the origin and with the source entities, and it's just you just know it's different. That there's no difference. That, well, there can be a difference in the in the clear audience way in which they communicate with with me, and it's it's just presence. I can only describe it as presence. The difference between the source entity and the origin is presence. The difference in presence, and the voice is fairly similar if I was if I was saying if I was picking it up clairaudiently. I mean Anne's voice is definitely different. And and I feel and I feel the difference between the OM collectively and HUM, for instance, um as being as, as being familiar to me. So it feels like me because it, it is me. They are me. I am it. They are, I am it and they are me. And the same and the same with Anne, although Anne's been individualised so I, so I, I, I hear Anne in her earthly voice, so to speak. But with the with the origin and the um, the source entity, it's just I just hear it as as me, but it's not me. It's not me. 
it's just I know it's not me because it's it's not the words not the words and, the, and the, the information that I would expect to hear from myself. So it's 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 it says it's, it's got this like neutrality about it. It's it's it's, it's an immenseness. You know this this presence. I think the the only way to describe it is presence. That's the only way to describe it. That's that's the difference. A difference in presence, certainly with certainly between the the, the source entity and the origin. Okay. Next question. Thank you. Is there a certain experience in the physical that will help us evolve faster than others? What I mean is that if we are all together experiencing bliss and communion with the God in it, with God in the energetic, then experiencing the opposite, such as solitude in the physical, help to help us evolve faster. If so, what kind of experience has the highest score of evolution? Balanced experience is what gives us the highest score of evolutionary content. We can't just have the good stuff. We have to have the good, the bad, and all the bits of shades of grey in between. We need to have the thought process that everything we experience is a benefit, irrespective of whether we like it or not. And that is the that is the attitude. That's the that's the way, state of beingness we need to have in our incarnations <clears throat> is to allow is to allow us to recognise that we need to be in a state of acceptance. And when we're in a state of acceptance, and we just deal with that which we which we subsequently um, end up being part of, and we deal with it in a, in a most efficient way without blaming others, just doing it and getting on with it and, and, and finalising the work to, to enable us to, to move onwards, then we will evolve faster. Okay, then our evolution will be faster based upon our term in our incarnation here. Good. Next question, if beings ultimately become entities, then source then the source being will ultimately become a source entity when the origin moves into the next polyomniscient sentient self-awareness. Yes, yeah. Everything becomes an, an entity because they have the ability to create, basically. Now, a being has got the ability to create anyway. I mean, a being can create an entity, but the, but it's, it's being transformed. When it goes into the next level of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness, the next level of 12 levels of structure, beyond the current level of 12 levels of structure of the origin, then the origin is, a, is, a, is assigning them to that next level rather than reabsorbing them. And in doing so, it changes their status, so to speak, from being to entity. And there's a difference in the, um, the functional capability of a being versus an entity. Okay, read the, I think, read the, the origin speaks, that'll, th that explains that. It might also explain it in the end dialogues as well. There's a definite difference in terms of the, the function, the functional ability between a being and an entity. But when we go into next, this next, you know, set of 12 levels of structure uh, that this origin is trying to move, trying to make polyomniscient sentient self-awareness, then everything that's part of the first series of 12 levels of structure will become given and granted an en en entity status or or beyond <laughs> who knows okay good question what is a sub frequency how does it differ from f frequency functionality wise it's The only way to describe it is a sub-frequency is the gaps in, is, is, fills the gaps in between one frequency to another. It's, it's like if we have a frequency, if we have the first frequency, second frequency, third frequency, fourth frequency, fifth frequency, sixth frequency, seventh frequency, etc., etc., then the gap in between the, the sixth to the seventh, if it if, if it's, has a, a metric, let's say a metric based upon ten, this is an example, okay? Then we go from 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, etc. So 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, etc., etc. is a sub-frequency of six. It's the next level up. It's all. It's the next. It's above six, but below seven, okay? And those are sub-frequencies. But you could also get sub-sub-frequencies. <laughs> you could get 6.1.1, .1, <laughs> 6.1.2, 6 6.1.3. So it's the gaps in between. It's the. It's the. The energy in the f that, it, that, it, that exists on the, mic the, the really micro level associated with, associated with the structure of 
everything that is, you know, obviously structure of source entity and therefore st structure of, um, of, 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 the, of the origin. Okay, so that's a good question. Hmm. So next question, how are source entities interacting with the source being? Is it similar to big brothers and sisters taking care of the newborn, the newborn and the physical? Um, I'm, I'm just asking the question actually because I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm being told that they're of clearly they're aware of its ex existence, but they and they acknowledge its existence and they're happy for it to be to be in existence and they applaud its existence and if they applaud that its root to sentience that it got to. But they're basically telling me that in in essence <laughs> they've got their, their eye on their own work to to a level where they 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 are focusing on what they're doing to create their own evolutionary progression on behalf of, of, of the origin. So they this presence is acknowledged and they're happy for it to be there and, and you know, obviously they, they could and would if they needed to communicate with it, but they're so engrossed with their own work that, they're, that, they're, that they are not really too, too concerned about whether they do communicate with it or not. And, and the source being is also you know, experiencing its own level of um, so we say focus as well. So this next question links into one from JM as well. Uh, she's good. We've, we've sort of sort of answered this question a little bit, but let's go over it again. You told me once that the the arm evolves as well. That when that then what happens to the arm when all the tests in source entity one are elevated and gain source entity status? I'm wondering if pure arm becomes super pure arm, or they don't change their status since they are not in the evolutionary cycle. Um, I think the next bit also links into it. Says, Why are the um who are not in the evolutionary cycle care about our evolutionary cycle so much? Oh, okay. Um, they're interested in this, but they don't want to be involved with it. <laughs> I think he's that, that answers that question. They're just interested to see how it works and interested to see how it affects those entities that are part of the, of the evolutionary cycle. And it's, it's like... Um, it's, just like, it's, ba it's like somebody. It's like watching somebody lie on a bed of nails. <laughs> yeah, interesting to see how they cope with it, how they do it, what the what the strategy is, what the posture is, how long they can stay there for, how sharp the nails are, how many nails there are there, what the population of the nails is <laughs> that allows the person to lie on the nails, bed of nails. So it's it's a bit like it's sort of a cursory interest if you want to see that. But um, I'm not. I'm not really seeing any any of them become super um, for example. They just are as they are. Uh, I'm being told it's quite a unique condition where they will be they will continue to be as they are. They will obviously gain evolution through ev evolution through, as a function of everybody else evolving. That's how they gain their evolution. Uh, as everything evolves, they they get they evolve as well because they're actually smaller individualized units of origin. That don't have a task. They're the uncreated creations. They are, you know, they just happened. So they, as from being told here, that they evolve as a function of everybody else evolving. So in the same way that the source evolves through its individualized units of sentience interacting with other things evolves, you know, doing their the you know incarnations and experiencing the multiverse evolve, so to speak. Um, so the so the source entity evolves. So as a function of the source entities evolving, so does the origin. Well, as a function of all these things evolving, so do the om. So, but I'm not seeing them become super om. Um, just more expansive, more aware, more. I suppose you could call them super om. They're telling me that they wouldn't call themselves that. <laughs> They're saying that we just are, and we exp and we evolve. We evolve as a function of others entering into the evolutionary cycle, just as the, some of the curators do, or all of the curators do. So they're saying that we just, we just are. They're saying what we will do is expand with the expansion of evolution as appropriately. Hmm, okay, fine. That's interesting. Um, they're, they're just basically, they're saying that we, we just, we'll just expand with the expansion. 
and that's it. We will always remain what we are, irrespective of what becomes. But we'll be, but the, but there will be synergy in terms of our expansive expansiveness or beingness as a result of who and what we are and how things around us evolve as well. Hmm. Okay. Next question. We sometimes hear about people die from drug overdose. So I'm wondering if their evolutionary deaths are the same as or worse as, as, uh, than death and suicide. Uh, death from a drug overdose might, might not be intentional, but it's not really accidental neither. Um, no, there's a, there's a different level of evolutionary death associated with, uh, with, with suicide. Uh, unless they are, unless um, in very rare cases, uh, an, an aspect or a soul is given an exemption from allowing, to, to, and, and that's and that becomes part of their the, the, the way, or should I say, their termination juncture to leave the incarnation that they're, they're currently in. Um, basically, it's a karmic debt they have. It's um, it becomes an issue in terms of they they need to be purified um, energetically and frequently before they can reintegrate or re re with their true energetic self. But also they have a very big level of karma associated with the addiction to and the attractivity to physical stimulus, um, which of course drugs are. So that's so they they don't actually get an evolutionary death per se, but they do get a significant amount of karma that they've got to overcome. Right, next question. Are generators always successful in creating new materials? Don't they ever fail or have accidents? Do they use event space to avoid failure? Um, I'm going to ask that question. The generators create materials, by the way, for those of you who haven't re read the curators. They, um, they don't see what we would classify as failure as being failure. They just see it as being knowledge and the evolution of knowledge to be able to do what they're doing and they may or may not use event space as an opportunity to shortcut things that's that's the answer to the question it's 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 it's, it's well if we if we can we can if we we don't we, we, have, we if we can do things we could we we, un, we enjoy making things they're saying we enjoy doing things making things and we enjoy the process of developing things so what could, what the human thought process would classify as being failure is actually a different level of success it's the elimination of a road or a route to creating what is desired to be created hmm. okay i think we should all think on those lines excellent thank you thank you entities for generating entities for giving me that information very good. Oh, next question. In the curators, page 164, it says that, yes, it is only the highest level of curators that can invoke the creation of the of general maintenance entity. These are, uh, um, these are entities that can do anything, basically. Additionally, it is only the highest level of curators that can uncreate or dissolve a general maintenance entity as well. Doesn't a general maintenance, maintenance entity ever fight back for its existence? Does it unwillingly be uncreated or dissolved? When it finishes its service, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I, I, I seem to remember the similar thought process when I channeled the information, and what I'm being told is that don't think in that way. It's 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 like they're created as a tool, an autonomous tool, and when the use of that autonomous tool is finished, it's reabsorbed. It's it's uncreated. So it's a little bit like um, creating a tool to do a job, and when you finish the job, you no longer need the tool, so you modify the tool to do something else, for example. That's the way to think of it. It's, uh, it's a bit like having a motor car. You have a motor car, you, you create a motor car, you drive the car, the, the, the car starts to fail and it gets old, so you disassemble it, and you melt it down again, and you create something else with, with the materials that are there. And, and it's, it's so that there's no, there isn't the thought process in the general maintenance entity's energy, so to speak, or or or, or, or tran transient um, 
consciousness or, or, or ability that, that, that allows it to go down the road of wanting to maintain its own individuality. Okay, good question there, very good. Next question. In the curator's page 299, it says that the more disharmonious frequencies that are combined, the more complicated the energy. The more complicated the energy, the more com capable it is of being able to perform more advanced and smaller tasks. Would you give us some examples of these more advanced and smaller tasks? Oh, I've got no idea. Um, I can't answer that question. Um, it, it, I'm being told it, it's to do with the structure, creating the structure of a universe or things that exist within the universe. Um, oh, I'm being given an example here. Things like the function that creates what we call black holes or wormholes is something like along those lines. The creation of the creation of the ability to work to connect two frequencies together is one of them. Two frequencies that are that are able to create a universal environment and connect two universal environments together is one of those things. Okay, so and I'm seeing things like. Like Nova, um, and in the in the gross physical, it could be the the the, the effect associated with it, with a, a sun going supernova, and the collapsing of that star it creates that condition that could potentially be used, but but isn't always. In fact, it's very rare that this that this that the, the function of a star going supernova and therefore collapsing in upon itself creates the condition where the low the higher frequency of a low the highest location or locally high frequency of a lower of a lower frequency within a lower universe is in contact with the locally low frequency of a higher frequency which is another higher universe and therefore creating the connectivity it, it, those things can be created without the need for a wormhole or, or a black hole and I'm being told that the use of those particular uh, disharmonious frequencies can create these connections as well, so they can, they can be used, but, it's, but that's and they can be they be, it can be created by entities who are very adept or very very high frequency, and can create these things um, as a function of their manipulation of the environment. Mm, usually a curator. Okay. Last question from M O. In the curator's page 303, it says any evolution of progression that is not part of the plan, say in the evolution of an energy to the point of sentience, is a bonus, a wonderful bonus. But its product cannot, cannot be used in the management of that which is used to evolve. Or is an evolution, environmental vehicle for evolution. Then when and how does source sense to use this wonderful bonus? That's a good question. Let me just ask the question. It's okay. It's the management of, isn't it? What I'm being shown here is it's, it, it is evolution which is there, which the source experiences and absorbs, but it can't be used to manage it. It can't be used to manage that which is which, which was which it used to evolve, um, or as a vehicle for evolution, or environmentally vehicle for evolution. So basically. Um, in any evolution progression that is not part of the plan, say in the evolution of energy to point of sentience, is a bonus, a wonderful bonus, but its product cannot be used in the management of that which, it, which is used to evolve. So basically, any entity that's created, or any sentience that's created as a result of this uh, of, of Darwin evolution, that is, that is outside of what was expected, i.e. that which was created or individualized from source, is an extra level of sentience that is created and therefore is part of source. Even if it's individualized, it can't be used to manage it. It can't be a, a curator, for example. Okay, so I hope that, it, hope that explains that. So it's, so, this is, so it's basically, it's like an expansion of the source's sentience, 
but it's just an expansion. It's like putting next. It's like putting extra memory into your computer. It becomes part of the computer. It's a bonus. It's an extra. It's an, it's an extra memory set, but it's not. But it can't be used to maintain the computer. It's just part of extra memory. Okay. Next question from B A. Uh, this question is regarding the anxiety which autistic people, for example. Uh, oh, so I'll start again. This question is regarding the anxiety with ang autistic people. For example, I was supposed to pick up my son at 12 p.m., but for some reason I was late for a few minutes. By the time I got to got to him to pick him up, he was having a meltdown. It tu this turns out he he got really upset that I wasn't there at 12 p.m. to pick him up, and after that he was very violent and angry. My question is, why do they have so much anger that leads to situations like this? More puzzling is the fact that even though they are higher frequency individuals than us, that why anxiety takes over their life. Your insight is much needed regarding this, and always I'm grateful for your answers. Well, basically put, we haven't told them we're late. <laughs> autistic, in, autistic individuals are incarnate souls who are operating on and communicating with lots and lots of different uh, frequencies concurrently, many more than our five senses. Okay, and so when we don't communicate to them or with them to advise them of something which is outside of the parameter that we set and we said that we were going to do, they get upset because we they they believed us. <laughs> they are they are pure, they are absolute, and when we say we're going to do something for an autistic individual, and um, they can feel that energy associated with that commitment. When we don't commit to it, they get annoyed. They get frustrated because they can't understand how they, how they can say how we can say one thing and not do it. But the thing is, if we, and they can experiment on this, um, BA and everybody else who has autistic children, autistic friends, or autistic um, family members, when we say we're going to do something, and we can't fulfil that commitment, send out the energies. Meditate on the individual, explaining why you're going to be different to what was broadcast to them. Whether you're going to be late, whether what you're going to give them is not what you said you were going to give them, whether where you were going to go to is not where you said you were going to go to. Broadcast, telepathize that which you are going to do differently, so that when you get to them, they already know there's going to be a change in what that change is. And then when you get to them, they, they'll be calm because they then know what that change is and there's no surprise to them and you are within the parameters that that they now know is part of their new expectation okay right so i hope that um and i'm, I'm sure that uh, us with big picture um big picture website will also use this piece of information because it's very useful there's lots of autistic individuals um, people with um, family and friends who've got schizophrenia or certain levels of, of of issues associated with multiple connectivity who will be interested to read that as well. So so please use it on the uh, the Big Pictures website, US. Okay, so let's have a look at the... Uh, that's, that's, that's the end of the questions. Let's have a look at the meditation to create peace in the world. So, it doesn't need to be a long meditation. Okay, so we've already had a lot of time within this satsanga. But what I want you to do is to sit straight, your back straight in a, in a straight backed chair, feet flat on the ground, palms lit uppermost on your upper thighs, uh, eyes closed, and your focus gently placed on the location or the origin of the spiritual third eye, which is in between the two eyebrows and above the bridge of the nose. And I want you to just feel what it's like to get frustrated sometimes when things don't happen. Just like in the autistic example, okay? Somebody doesn't do what they committed to do for you. Somebody is late. Always early, because sometimes people being early is a is a little bit of a shock to the system. If, we, if we're not, if we need to have the extra time before they were supposed to be joining us, for example. 
What about our other expectations that we have of ourselves, of other individuals, of leaders, governments, countries, the world population in general? All of these expectations are self-generated. All of these things are based upon our wants. Wants and desires are physical things whilst we're incarnate. So if we can concentrate on just being in acceptance, Everybody is in acceptance of everybody else. There's no friction between people, there's no expectation. Everything that happens in the way it's supposed to happen. As a result, we become content because we're in the experience of that which is going with a certain flow. So people aren't late, it's just that they're arriving at the right time people haven't failed, it's just that they're experiencing a different level of success. Or are experiencing the process associated with eventual success. People are experiencing different levels of affluence because that's what they've chosen as part of their life plan. Every one of us has experienced being a king being famous, having status, having superb health. We've all experienced being abjectly poor, having physical health, running away from danger, being caught up in a war, dying from disease. Everything that's experienced worldwide is being experienced for a reason. That reason is the collective, in-depth, full experiential opportunity that presents itself in the now. Everything that's experienced, being experienced is part of an evolutionary progression that we undertake on behalf of our Trinitatic selves who in turn are, in are experiencing it to gain evolution for themselves and for source, which in turn is gaining this evolution on behalf of origin. In gaining evolution there is no status. There is no one better than anybody else. The evolutionary content associated with them and accrued by a beggar in the street is just as important and is equal to the evolutionary progression accrued by a chief executive officer of a multi-billion dollar corporation which is the same as the evolutionary progression by a great spiritual leader which is the same as the evolution accrued by an individual who has the so-called average life. Everything is equal when it comes to evolutionary progression. Everything is important. Everything has the same status. Everything has the same evolutionary weight or quality associated with it while we're here. Nobody is doing better than anybody else. Everybody is doing what they can do with the tools around them to allow them to do what they need to do to experience, learn and evolve in this particular incarnation. Everybody is experiencing nowness in their own way. When we recognise all of this, but irrespective of what we're doing, we're all important, our evolution is always important, our progression is always important.
then there is no jealousy. There is no, there is no desire to experience somebody else's experience. The grass is never greener. It just is always what it is. When we can experience this and know this, we start to become content, knowing that we're doing a good job. Everything is creating evolutionary progression. Every piece of evolutionary progression from any, anybody and everybody around the planet is as, just as important as everybody else's. Every piece of evolution is of vital importance to the, or the, the source entity and therefore the origin. This realization creates contentment awareness of being in the now and happiness of being in the now and a state of peace associated with it knowing that all is well everything is well everybody has to experience everything that everybody else is experiencing And every part of it is a different way of experiencing, learning and subsequently evolving. So the minute changes in experience make a big difference. And everybody has these minute changes of experience and everybody makes a big difference. So we're all important. Every action, every thought, every state of beingness, every piece of service, Everything we do is all important. It's just as important as everything else. So there are no haves and have nots. There are no better thans or worse thans. There are no differences between us. Everything just is. Everything is perfect. Everything is optimal. Everything is progressive. Everything is in balance. Everything contributes equally and absolutely. So with this depth of feeling associated with it. It permeates through us. Knowing that we're all doing a good job together, collectively together. We feel peace in our heart, for there's no jealousy. There's no desire to have somebody else's experience. There is no need for more. This knowledge that we're all equal creates this synergetic effect of total communion with each other. We're all one. We're all one and the same. We're all source. We're all one with the source and the source is all one with us and we are the source. Knowing that we are God and God is us, source is us and we are source, creates a peace within us. realization creates a condition where conflict disappears there's no point to be in conflict because we fight if we're in conflict we're only fighting ourselves because we're all source so why fight yourself for something that is 
not necessary because everything is equal everything is providing of benefit a, an evolutionary benefit to everything and everyone every source and every aspect of the origin just sit and bask in this feeling of total oneness of experience this peace of being just being getting the feeling that the best way to be is just to be do what we're doing and if needs be help others to do what they're doing very important as we help them it helps us as it helps us it helps them just sit here feeling this peace it's all over the world when people start to realize that we're all one there's no individuality there's just us as part of the sentience of the source which is part of the sentience that is the origin So slowly come back into the room, slowly open your eyes, feel the, the freedom, the contentment and the peace associated with this level of awareness and understanding. And know that this, your feeling this broadcasts the same feeling to those others around you. If you get a chance, take a drink of water to help ground you. If you come back into the room and open your eyes. And that's the end of January Satsanga. Thank you very much for your questions. Really good questions. They're always good questions. And they're all written down and transcribed. And may end up being the baker's dozen in terms of the books. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. It could well be. That's the way forwards. A book based upon satsanga questions. Okay. So, thank you very much for participating. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next satsanga, which I believe will be, when I look at my diary, uh, when my computer catches up. <laughs> okay. It will be in clearly February and it's looking like it's going to be the 27th of February. So I look forward to energetically connecting with you all then. So God's love to you all. Namaste. Stay high frequency. And don't forget the source loves you all. Goodbye and I look forward to being energetically connected with you next time. Did you see the aliens in Crete? <laughs>